All right, let's talk about modern physics. Modern physics is a wide open world. We're going to be covering all kinds of little topics. Unfortunately, I won't go into great depth on any one topic, which I should, uh, but I won't be. Understand that this concept of modern physics is really referring to any physics that took place after right around 1900. We're talking about a difference between classical physics and modern physics. And I'll get down here in a second, but this is an interesting quote that a lot of physics teachers use uh, because it kind of puts us in the frame of mind of the physics uh, scientists and mathematicians and chemists of the time. And so Lord Kelvin says, and this is towards the end of the 1800s, this is basically where we have the peak of classical physics, there is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. Isn't that an interesting quote? Basically assumes that we know everything we need to know, and now it's all about just refining it. And that is completely not true. Uh, all sorts of different experiments in the earlier 1900s blew open physics as we know it. Uh, and we're going to lead off explaining uh, black body radiation. It's not necessarily sequentially what came first, but more or less it does. And so when we talk about modern physics, at least the next several video lessons, we're really talking about quantum physics, or at least the introduction to quantum physics. So I'm going to try to spend some time explaining what quantum means uh, and why we were able to determine that some things do have a quantum-like effect. So let's just kind of focus on this box right here. Energy is quantized in some systems. What does that mean? Well, it means that the system can only have certain energies and not a continuum of energies. This is the idea of quantum that it increases in specific steps, not continuously. So uh, if I were to draw a ramp of increasing elevation, right, this is height. Uh, it increases continuously. That would not be quantum. A quantum relationship of the same effect would be like drawing in stairs instead. You can still increase, but you have to do it one step at a time, not continuously. More on this idea later. So let's kind of loosely define the difference between the two uh, terms. Classical physics would be anything more or less before 1900 often referred to as Newtonian physics. That doesn't imply Newtonian physics is not correct, it just wasn't complete. And two things that are going to come into play during the next series of videos is that classic physics says energy increases continuously, meaning it's not quantized, and it also describes light as a wave. Modern physics starts to change some stuff. This is where we start getting into the quantum and particle physics realm. Particle physics will come into play uh, in several videos later. We're talking about the standard model. That's not going to come into play right now. This is more or less about quantum physics. And really, we're talking about most of the new physics theories that took place post-1900. And the two that I'm going to isolate right now is they define energy as something that's quantized. And that, is light a wave? Is light a particle? What is light? And modern physics tries to explain that. So, back in the time where everyone thought physics was pretty much complete, there were a few things that truly troubled physicists. And one of those things is this concept called black body radiation. Uh, I'm going to need to take some time to explain what this means to then eventually explain why it was troubling. So let's first describe what black body radiation is. And let's look at this first box here. Uh, in order for energy to become absorbed, okay, in order for something to be absorbing energy, the electrons within that material actually resonate. Okay? So if we have, let's say, an infrared light wave, heat, coming in and falling incident on an object, if the object's electrons resonate as a result of that particular light wave, it will absorb the energy. Okay? This is true. This was defined prior to um, the quantum realm, so we're talking classical physics here still. And uh, really, don't forget it's any oscillating EM wave, so light is what we'll use, but you know, it could be X radiation or microwaves, anything of that nature. So, I mean, let's kind of think about this in terms of these two things, or maybe even a third thing that I'll describe over here more, uh, maybe soot. Okay? Like gooey melted carbon. Okay, uh, Let's think about glass. When we have a window, are we afraid to touch that window when it's hot out outside? No, of course not. We know that that glass doesn't tend to absorb that energy. That energy pretty much travels right through it. 
This has to do with the fact that the electrons are simply the ones that are able to vibrate at that incident light that's hitting the glass. There are few of them, so it will only absorb a little bit of the energy. Not too much gets absorbed at all. But then we get things like metal. We know metal can get quite hot. We don't want to necessarily touch a bar of metal that's been out on a nice, hot, sunny day all day long. And it's because the electrons in metal are much easier uh, to resonate, or there are more of them that will oscillate at a given incident ray. Or wave. And then we've got this stuff like soot, that gooey, carbony stuff. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been near uh, soot-like material, but it gets hot easily. If you are leave that out on a hot day, you go to touch it, you're going to burn yourself. And once again, it has to do with the ability for the electrons in these materials to resonate. And simply, soot and metal have just more freely available electrons, hence they will absorb energy easier. So when we use the term a black body, we're really talking about an idealized situation, something that's not really real, uh, but will help us identify the maximum end of absorption. And so a black body is anything that will absorb and then consequently radiate all incident electromagnetic radiation. So for example, glass only absorbs a small amount, metal a little bit more, so a little bit more than that. An idealized black body, every single f um, frequency within the EM spectrum that hits it will be absorbed and then eventually uh, re-radiated. We call it a black body because simply put, uh, the color black absorbs all visible light. So it makes sense to utilize that term to talking about all of the EM spectrum. But it doesn't actually technically have to be black uh, as long as it absorbs all all of the electromagnetic spectrum it is an idealized black body. And so remember, this is idealized. It doesn't really exist in nature, but we get things that are very close to being a perfect black body. And so in classical physics, and, and scientists at the time knew this was wrong. This was why this was one of the troubling concepts in terms of classical physics. What classical physics says is that as you increase the intensity or overall energy of a light wave or radiation, uh, the frequency itself should also increase, or vice versa. As we increase the frequency of radiation, so shouldn't that intensity. And really what that is saying is more or less frequency is proportional to I squared. I'm not going to write out the whole equation that was described. Um, this is more a proportion. And so uh, what we're talking about here is more energy from the EMR is absorbed. What it would really say is that the particles, the freely available electrons in that black body will vibrate faster and faster and faster at higher and higher and higher frequencies. And so that shows that as that intensity goes up, that frequency in which the electrons in the material vibrate will go up and up and up and up exponentially. We don't understand that an oscillating electron will create its own EM wave. So that also implies that the more intense light that hits the black body, the more intense the frequency it radiates outward will become. And so classical physics says that the frequency being released as the intensity goes up and up and up will climb exponentially, meaning really the way I interpret this is, is that if we're seeing red light um, well, I can think of a piece, piece of metal. When you heat up a piece of metal, it first starts to glow red, right? And then it starts to glow white hot. But we don't ever worry about it glowing to the point where it is glowing ultraviolet hot or gamma hot, right? Because we know that a certain temperature, the frequency in which is being emitted, say right here, uh, is really all that we get and it starts to level off. This model, the classical model, says that we should start receiving, if we see so, uh, X amount of red light, for example, we should see significantly more ultraviolet or gamma radiation. And that's simply not what happens. For example, the classical model truly doesn't happen. What? Let me take a look at this graph down here. What the classical model says is that it should exponentially climb. In reality, what we have happening is it does climb like the model might predict, and then it peaks off, and then it tapers out. And we do not get any of that ugly gamma radiation or ultraviolet radiation, or at least limited ultraviolet radiation. Ultraviolet is really kind of that cap, which I'll talk about over here.
So um, let's look at this a little bit closer. Instead, the intensity of the emitted radiation does increase until it reaches, and this is the key bit here, a particular frequency that depends on the temperature, and then it drops. So you get a certain temperature of metal, it might drop after red or white light or ultraviolet. Okay, And that experimentation that doesn't match reality is what troubled physicists. And this is actually known as the ultraviolet catastrophe. Uh, and so if you look at this graph over here, I'm actually on my x-axis here has wavelength. Remember, that's inversely related to frequency. So instead of it climbing up as we go to the right, it goes down as we go to the right. And um, what we're showing here is that, at, let's say at 3,000 Kelvin, the material will glow red hot. Well, if we look at this, this is the graph, the plot of the frequency being emitted by that red, uh, that 3,000 Kelvin object. You're going to see it's going to peak out right about here which means the majority of the energy that is radiating away from this is actually infrared, it's heat, um, but we're going to get a sizable amount of red light and significantly less blue and violet light and, and very little ultraviolet light. So this will more or less look red hot because the majority of the spectrum radiating away from it is infrared and red color. As that temperature climbs up to, say, 4,000 Kelvin, that peak starts to shift towards the ultraviolet end of the spectrum. So now we're starting to find um, the peak isn't infrared anymore. The peak is now uh, maybe yellowish, orangish, or a greenish light. We're still getting a sizable portion of red and heat. That's all still in here. Okay, And we're also getting now a sizable portion of the blues, the violets, and the pinks. And still, also some ultraviolet. This is closer, but not quite at white hot. But it is starting to go towards that bluish to whitish color. And if we increase the temperature even more, say 6,000 Kelvin, that peak starts to shift even more to the left. Maybe now we're in the violet region of the spectrum. And so we're going to get a sizable amount of blue, green, yellows, reds, heat. We're getting all of that together. And so we're getting the entire color spectrum being emitted off of this object, creating white light. But we're still going to get ultraviolet. But if you notice, that drops suddenly. Okay, so maybe this is the ultraviolet spot. Way down here is your, your uh, gamma radiation or x-rays uh, that, that you barely get any emission from at all. So it, it, it does happen. The hotter the substance gets, the more prone UV rays or even more dangerous rays come out of it, but it still tapers off. It peaks out at right around the ultraviolet spectrum. Uh, FET has this awesome little simulation here that helps kind of show this a little bit more. I'm not going to spend a great amount of time on that, but uh, I encourage you to go to the website phet.colorado.edu and seek out this black body simulation. But what we've got here is I can increase the temperature of the object and we're going to see where it peaks out and we get an idea of what color it looks like. For example, if I were to lower this temperature to say an oven. <clears throat> I can't see much here, right? So i got to zoom in. And where are we going to get that? Oh, let me get a little bit more temperature here. There. You know, somewhere around the light bulb. A uh, regular incandescent light bulb. The majority of what we're getting coming out of that is heat. You know, we're wasting a significant portion of that energy as heat. We start to get uh, that reddish tapering down and that bluish. If you look at a light bulb, it might kind of glow like an orangish white color. And as we increase that temperature of that object, we will start to shift that peak over and we're going to start to get a, a truer to white color still will glow a little bit off-white and we get to the temperatures of say the sun and the sun really does appear white I know for us it appears yellowish that's because of the atmosphere is changing the true color of the sun if you were out in space looking at the sun it would look pretty close to white and it's because that peak is right here and almost smack dab in the middle of the visible light spectrum and so we're getting all kinds of visible light we're getting all kinds of infrared we are still getting uh, ultraviolet and some of the more dangerous radiation and as that temperature goes up the more available dangerous radiation also goes up and that peak shifts to the left but it doesn't shift very far to the left uh, it almost always caps off peaks out right in that ultraviolet region so what does this mean well honestly no one really knew and so this guy named Max Planck pretty uh, important dude a German physicist um, use this concept that the atoms and the molecules in the body will 
oscillate and absorb that radiation. He knew that they would shake and then re-emit that radiation. And what he then suggested, and honestly, he kind of got here via a mathematical approach, not necessarily through what he thought made sense, but s through experimentation. Actually, the saying goes, he was hired by a lighting company to try to improve the light bulbs, so it was emitting more visible light and less heat, so there wasn't as much waste to make things a little bit less expensive to use. Uh, and it ended up turning out to be a lot more than that. Uh, he came up with this idea that he says those atoms and molecules in the material that vibrates, they must vibrate at a quantized level. So that means there needs to be specific energies that get introduced to get it to vibrate. And then another specific increment of that energy to get it to vibrate more. And then another increment of energy to get it to vibrate even more. And it doesn't just continuously vibrate as we add energy. It'll vibrate until we get a certain amount of energy. And then it'll vibrate more. And then as we get even more energy, it'll vibrate even more. And so this quantized thing it was, was really first introduced by Max Planck. Not only that, he was able to do some experimentation, some work to even recognize that quantized value. He says that the energy in which uh, any object needs to absorb or even radiate uh, is equal to a constant that he was able to derive, which is later called Planck's constant. It's a really tiny number, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. Uh, and so if we take Planck's constant and multiply it by the frequency of that oscillation, we will learn and determine how much energy was required to be absorbed to get it to vibrate at that particular frequency. And, and that model actually fits the true real-life representation of that drop-off. Now, this is an exaggerated graph that's linearized. It doesn't have that nice curvy looking. So kind of take this graph with a grain of salt, but more or less, it shows that as we increase that frequency, the amount of energy that is required to get it to vibrate goes up significantly. So we don't ultimately get that frequency because we don't have enough available energy there to get it to oscillate at a higher value. And this whole concept of quantized energy literally blows open physics. And that's where people like Einstein come into play and come up with some pretty neat effects that we're going to talk about in the, uh, future videos. Before I move ahead, though, uh, one thing I just want to review. We have discussed in prior units. It's this concept of an electron volt. Uh, it is the amount of energy required to move one single electron through one voltage of potential difference. And that energy is equal to 1.6 times 10 negative 19 joules. This is important to remember because often uh, we're dealing with really tiny values and it's easier to represent our energy as electron volts than it is to represent as joules. Okay, that's it for black body radiation. We're now going to see what effect or what this has in terms of some of the um, more famous stuff such as the photoelectric effect by Einstein. Thank you.